I am going to talk the goals for this talk. I'm going to go over the imaging protocol. Um, Leo mentioned that, that this is kind of an MR focused talk. A lot of us do uh, MR. Uh, I'm going to skip over some background because we already we already had some great intro to that. Um, I'm also not going to talk about MR lymphangiography uh, because the speaker following me, Jeff Jeff Maki, is going to do a great job talking about that and way better than I can do. Um, uh, so I'm going to show you how I do preoperative assessment with MRI, how we do a postoperative assessment, and then just a, a brief note on, on how we report uh, these cases. Here are my disclosures, none relevant to this talk. Goals of imaging. Uh, uh, why are we doing an MRI? It's a long test. It's, a, it's an expensive test. Um, you're in you know, a tight, uh, long donut uh, for an hour uh, that you don't want to be in. Um, so the goal, so we, I review this protocol in advance with the, the plastic surgeon to really answer a relevant clinical questions. Um, we want to display anatomy. We want to display anatomy of the affected limb. We also want to display anatomy of the unaffected limb. Uh, when you're imaging legs, you know, they're both kind of in the bore at the same time, so it's really easy to display both of them at, at the same time. Um, we also want to look at uh, vascular pedicles. Uh, donor pedicles, recipient pedicles. Uh, we want to look at tissue. Uh, I, I was actually so impressed throughout the day that we, you, know, you can tell that multiple centers are using MRI to guide fluid versus fat assessment. Uh, and that's kind of what, what Joe, Mark, and I started years ago in New York, and, and it's how, how we continue. And it's just it's great to see the other, other centers do that and, and validate that. Um, because MRI is a 3D technique, we can, uh, we can uh, 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 do measurements, and I'll show you some of those measurements. Um, we talked about uh, uh, pedicle patency and vascular assessment, and also, you know, keeping in mind patient satisfaction. Uh, I mentioned how, how this is a long exam. You know, when I first started this and we had older uh, machines, this could be a three-hour exam. Um, and, and certainly, uh, to Dr. Slavin's point earlier, you know, that was not really reimbursed, so no one was really happy with me, especially the patients, though, because who wants to be in a magnet for three hours? Um, so now we have some, some newer machines, and, and I'll go over some coils um, um, that have brought that down to 60 minutes or less. Um, so really, uh, uh, what we do in MRI, we do, uh, for, for those of you who know, we do T1 and T2-weighted imaging, um, and those are either tissue-based or, or fluid-based. Um, so a lot of what I do is, is T1-weighted post-contrast images, and depending on which vendor you have, you know, they're kind of the big three that we all have in terms of GE, Philips, and Siemens. Um, it's pretty much the same sequence. Uh, it's really high resolution. Um, so, so we want sub-millimeter voxel resolution um, so that, you know, the x-axis is less than a millimeter, the y-axis is less than a millimeter, and the z-axis is also a millimeter or less. And if you have that, then you can reconstruct that in multiple planes. Um, if we're imaging legs, we image in the coronal plane, so front to back. Um, if we're imaging arms, we image from side to side. And that's just to decrease scan time. Um, we don't want to image up and down a leg because that would take you know, just an hour for, for, for each leg. Um, uh, Contrast-wise, um, we spoke last night at the, at the radiology dinner. Um, there was some blood pool agents that we used to use, um, and I know that Jeff is going to speak more about ferromoxetol or, or ferroheme, um, which is a blood pool agent, um, but, but uh, there, there are other gadolinium agents that we inject intravenously uh, that do have, have blood pool capability, so we can image you know, minutes after injection. Um, Wide bore MR imaging. People may be familiar with you know those tight magnets that we have currently. Well, nowadays we make magnets that are actually wider. Even though it's only ten centimeters, it makes a big difference if you're a patient. Um, uh, and that also opens up the isocenter that we that we like to use. Uh, 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 the optimal place to image soft tissue is in the middle of the magnet. Um, so you know an arm is not in the middle of the body, so it's kind of hard to image that. So the wider the magnet, we're able to kind of tilt patients one way or the other and try and get it as close to isocenter as possible. Um, when imaging the legs, and I, I, you know, Leo and I spoke about this before, 
uh, and I know Jeff is aware, you know, there, there are certain coils you can get. So if your center is going to start up an MR program and you're going to do legs, um, uh, there's a very expensive coil. It's about $150,000, but it's really worth it because it really decreases scan time from, you know, from two hours to one hour just by getting that coil. Um, so it will pay for itself uh, in short order. Um, there's a new type of fat saturation uh, that, that we scan patients with. Um, when we do our T1-weighted imaging, which is kind of fluid dark, um, now we're able to get multiple sequences at the same time. So we actually get four sequences in one scan acquisition, and so we're able to see water-only imaging, uh, which is fat-saturated imaging. We're able to see fat-only imaging, uh, and I'll give you examples of how, how we look at that. Um, uh, but it really drastically reduces our scan time. Um, when we're doing legs, we, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're imaging the affected leg and the unaffected leg uh, simultaneously, so that also makes this kind of under, uh, you know, less than 60-minute exam. Um, for upper extremities, we don't use this expensive coil. We just use a routine body coil that we do for liver imaging or any kind of pelvic imaging, and we just move it around uh, from side to side based on uh, which extremity uh, we're imaging. Um, 1.5 versus 3 Tesla, um, uh, both have benefits, uh, uh, both have uh, some limitations. Um, I have usually scanned on 1.5 Tesla just because of artifacts, and, and that's uh, where our, our fancy expensive coils are. Um, uh, with arms, however, as I mentioned, you have to image them separately. So it certainly increases scan time uh, when we're scanning upper extremity patients. Um, so here's an example of the coils. Um, so the, uh, uh, this top coil here is, is when we're imaging legs. You can see that the toes are just sticking out there, but you know, it's basically a blanket that, that you're covered in. Um, and this is that body coil. So we actually will move it from one side to the other side, depending on you know, if we're scanning the affected arm or the unaffected arm. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. This is my, you know, uh, poor rendition of an MRI, <laughs> and that's a patient in there. Um, <laughs> so this is really fancy PowerPoint, you know, stuff here. Um, but anyway, that, that dot is the isocenter of the magnet, so I want to get whatever I'm imaging as close to that red dot as possible. Um, so so what, we, what we used to do in the smaller magnets was have uh, if we're imaging the left arm, you know, the right arm would be up and the patients would kind of be turned to the side um, and, and we would scan this arm and then we would flip and, and do the same the other way. Um, the, the reason you want things in the middle is so that when you're doing fat saturation uh, uh, and other techniques, um, you limit all those artifacts. Um, so so those, those have worked well for us. And then the wider bores kind of help with that, uh, with this positioning e even more so. Um, okay, so when, we're, when we assess the limb preoperatively, uh, we're looking at the extent of fluid versus fat, so lymphedema versus fat hypertrophy, um, and I'll show you how we can also calculate limb volumes. Um, as I said, MRL, uh, Jeff will speak about. Um, we also look at the vessels, that's why we give contrast. Um, you know, not infrequently, uh, we do see occult thrombus within, within clots. You know, patients have had axillary lymph node dissection. There's a lot of scarring in the axilla. Scarring in the axilla leads to scarring of vessels. And if you have a narrowed vessel, this slow blood flow, you can develop clots. Um, we talked about donor sites, recipient sites, uh, uh, and other causes for limb swelling. Unfortunately, sometimes if we have patients uh, who come to see us, that, you know, we've had a few cancer recurrences that were unknown uh, which actually was a result of, of the limb swelling. Um, so here's an example of some limb architecture. Hopefully that, that projects okay. Um, so on the left is lower extremity. On the right is an affected upper extremity limb. Um, this is a T1-weighted sequence, so the fat is bright. Um, so what we're able to do is, is look at the fat, and then you can see the, the dark lines that are, that are uh, scattered throughout the fat on the affected larger leg that's fluid. Um, and, and same thing uh, uh, with the upper arm. So we're able to take these 3D measurements um, because this is a 3D uh, volume acquisition. Um, so we're able to highlight uh, uh, a region of interest um, and get a total arm volume. 
uh, whether it's hand, whether it's upper arm, whether it's forearm. The arms we have to break up in terms of imaging, so, so it does add time if we want to get volumes for, for each section. Um, uh, but this is a way of getting total volume uh, 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 of the affected extremity. Uh, in addition, uh, we're starting uh, with, with, with our, our colleagues at uh, Sloan Kettering, and I know it ties here, he may, he may talk about some of this tomorrow. Um, uh, we talked earlier about standardization. Um, so, you know, Leo and I and, and, and Jeff, as we embark on this, uh, on this imaging journey, we, we should standardize how we're going to measure uh, uh, our limb volumes on MR. Uh, so one idea is to find a bony landmark, um, like the greater tubercle, uh, take 15 centimeters distal, and then just measure the distal 5 uh, uh, centimeters. Uh, another option is going from the radial humeral joint and going uh, uh, craniad 10 centimeters and then measuring that volume uh, every time on every patient. So you actually get a consistent measurement um, uh, uh, from scan to scan and from patient to patient. We have 3D software now that you can highlight um, uh, the various tissues um, uh, within the extremity. So, you know, MR is great for actually separating tissues like fluid and fat. Uh, so you can see here we're highlighting uh, fat and we're highlighting everything that isn't fat. And then actually we're able to, um, uh, to, to get volumes of that. So you can see we, you know, down to the uh, milliliter, uh, we, we can get a volume of an affected extremity and then compare pre and post-op volumes um, uh, quite accurately. Um, we, we've had some great discussions on, on uh, bioelectric impedance. Um, you're going to hear a lot about lymphocytography and MRL, so I'm kind of going to I'm going to skip over this. Um, we do do non-contrast MRL, or really, it's really just uh, 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 fluid-sensitive imaging. Uh, for the surgeons in the room, this is basically an MRCP um, when we look for gallstones, uh, uh, and we just do heavily T2-weighted fluid imaging over the affected extremity. I tend to do it on the initial visit and not on follow-up visits. Um, just because it adds time, at least five to seven minutes per station. Um, so again, just, just thinking of the patient's uh, satisfaction, and if it's not needed for, for the surgeon or for the assessment, we'll, we'll skip it on follow-ups. Um, I mentioned venous and arterial anatomy. Um, here, here is a patient who has extensive axillary scarring, um, and you can see that the, the axillary vein is, is occluded. Um, uh, and this was actually very helpful for, for the planning. So when, the, when, when Joe did the surgery, um, he knew to go in and then also plan for, uh, uh, for a venous procedure um, uh, to, to allow for proper venous drainage of the extremity in addition to, to the vascularized lymph, lymph node transfer flap. Um, here was a case just from a week ago or two weeks ago, um, a patient who has an occult thrombus um, Within the distal axillary vein, there was a stenosis in the axilla, uh, so there was slow blood flow, and then this occult thrombus. So, so that it's important for, for the surgeons to know this, um, and we talk regularly, um, so the patient could be started on anticoagulation. Um, donor site assessment. Um, back when we first started, we were doing donor flaps from the groin, and as uh, I think Leo or someone mentioned earlier, a lot of flaps now are omental flaps. Um, would love to be able to image omentum, um, and maybe Jeff or Leo could, could find a way to do it that, that I can't. Uh, you know, omentum has bowel that has air, which is an enemy of MRI, and it has uh, motion, which is another enemy of MRI. So it's difficult to evaluate uh, an omental flap preoperatively. Um, but here in the, in the groin flap, uh, uh, we're highlighting nodes here that are lateral to the SIEV, or superficial inferior epigastric vein, and above the inguinal crease. And those nodes we've shown drain the abdominal wall rather than the leg. So if you actually harvest those nodes, you're not going to get donor site lymphedema um, than if you were to uh, harvest nodes that are more medial or more inferior. Uh, and that's just highlighted uh, in this slide here. Um, so post-operatively, um, uh, we're able to look at, we really want to look at the, uh, uh, you know, enhancement of the, of the flap, and is it viable? So that's what, you know, Joe or Mark the, or Bobak they'll call me and say, you know, is it a viable flap? Um, so we look at the pedicle, 
uh, uh, whether the pedicle, the vascular pedicle enhances. Um, look at fat versus fluid uh, within the extremity, but also in the flap. Um, uh, and then again, we can look at limb volumes. Um, here is, uh, this is a MIP image, uh, maximum intensity projection image uh, uh, from an MRA. Um, so, so this patient had um, a flap placed, and you can see the, the blue circle is, is highlighting those enhancing, robustly enhancing lymph nodes in the vascularized lymph node transfer flap, indicating uh, uh, a patency of that pedicle and an enhancement of those nodes. Um, here's another patient who had a wrist flap. Uh, uh, and we spoke about this, this earlier, another colleague. Um, uh, what I'm highlighting here in blue is all these enhancing lymph nodes uh, within this flap, and this is kind of a cross-section image. So, so because it's so superficial, we can really get exquisite imaging through the flap, and you can see that the fat uh, within the flap is dark, just like as, as normal fat should be on this fat-saturated sequence. The nodes enhance beautifully, uh, and all the vessels within the flap enhance, ind indicating their, their patent. Um, so for flap viability, th those are the, the three things we look for, vascular status, lymph node enhancement, and fluid versus flap versus fat. Um, Postoperative swelling can be common in these flaps. So clinically, it may kind of be difficult to determine whether the flap is viable or not. Here's an example of a non-viable flap. Flap. So remember before I showed you uh, the flap was dark because the fat sat was dark. In this case, we did not make the fat dark. The fat is bright. However, the flap is completely dark. Um, so there's no enhancement in that flap. Um, it's filled with edema on this T2-weighted sequence. Um, uh, so this is a non-viable flap, uh, and that was confirmed uh, surgically. Um, we spoke briefly about limb volume and how we can measure kind of reductions from, from pre-op to post-op. Um, so that's something we're, we're working on uh, actively now. Um, here's an example of, of, you know, I told you we get sagittal images, but because they are um, uh, uh, isotropic voxels, we, we can reconstruct in, in multiple planes. But here, here's a patient who has, uh, you know, skin thickening and, and lymphedema, and you can see nearly a year after surgery, um, uh, the skin, skin thickening drastically reduced um, in addition to uh, lymphedema. So reporting pearls, I, I never report in a vacuum ever. Um, it's constant communication uh, between uh, the ordering provider and, and me. Um, so I always, I have no hesitation calling the surgeon for help. Um, although, you know, sometimes the, the, someone will pick up from the OR and then he'll have to, you know, talk <laughs> via scrub tech or something. Um, so reporting template, I think this is Jeff, so he'll, he'll talk about it in more detail. Um, uh, what, what, Joe, Mark, Bobak, and I do um, um, is a grading system. So, so we developed this grading system, which is, which is very simple. It's just 0, 1, 2, which you know, corresponds to mild, moderate, or severe. Um, uh, we look at location of the fat in the fluid um, and describe it in a, in a four-quadrant uh, section on axial images and on coronal images. Um, talk about the predominance of where the fluid uh, is, uh, and then... Um, uh, on follow-up, give 3D volumes uh, uh, as an addendum when, once we make them. Uh, and those volumes are in milliliters. So here's an example of just some, just some severe cases. Um, the images on the left are fluid-only images, so, so that's water. Uh, uh, and you can see it's very bright. Um, the image on the, on the top right is, um, this is fat bright uh, and fluid dark. And, and that's my timer. <laughs> Um, uh, and then on the, uh, uh, these images just highlight fat is bright and, and fluid is bright also. Um, uh, and here are just some, some images showing, showing the same. Again, severe cases. Um, so in summary, uh, MRI really is a robust radiation-free exam, right? We don't want to, pay, these patients have been radiated enough. Um, so uh, MRI is radiation-free. Um, and it can depict relevant anatomy, architecture, exclude secondary causes of swelling, um, vascular assessment, uh, and postoperatively can assess the donor flap uh, number and quality of lymph nodes in the flap and the, and the local anatomy. Um, and we're actively pursuing and, and would love to do in combination 
uh, uh, trials to detect subclinical disease and, and quantify uh, lymphatic dysfunction. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.